Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today, and welcome back to the Union. Um, I wanted to start by talking about your early career. Mm. You were educated at the National Youth Theatre. Uh, so well, I was got not educated, I got in, but not quite well. <laughs> I was dreadful. But after that, what yes, got you creator. into politics and history and then eventually law from such a different field? Well, that's a, you know, a long-winded and a boring question, but I certainly wasn't educated. Um, the National Youth Theatre was, um, I think probably some of you may, may have done it, um, they let me in and I was infinitely too young, I think, to have done it. I was 14. And very recently, some of you may have listened, sadly she died, to the late sister Wendy, but they replayed her Desert Island Discs. And there was something that she said which really resonated with me, saying she wasn't terribly um, intelligent, but she was very good at putting her goods in the shop window. Um, and that's always how I felt. Um, I was fundamentally useless, had no talent, but could really fake it. Um, and have managed in a variety of ways to build a career on that. Um, and the answer was, I tried to get in here. Um, Oxford, that is. I did come to debate here. And I, um, it was back in the, a while ago where you did um, exams. And if you passed, you got a 2E offer. Well, it, it turns out they, they didn't want me. I was applying to do PPE, and I certainly um, wasn't ready. Um, uh, 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 in, in one of the interviews, I was asked um, what the difference between pornography and erotica was. And I think I glibly answered the type of thing I would have said back then, probably about 395. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, didn't go well. Um, and so um, I was going to take a year off and come back and reapply, and I should tell you, I was completely devastated, actually. G genuinely devastated. It was my first very important knock, actually. And my, the, the, the teacher that I most admired uh, had gone to Manchester. And they said, back in the day when you could go to university and it was debt-free, and so consequently risk-free, or the risk was different, um, and um, the, 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 the various aspects of your privilege you had to consider in a different way, I decided to go to Manchester, and it turned out to be the most extraordinary luck and gift, because I went in the 90s, when a lot of you, I suspect, were around and um, perhaps not. Um, but uh, uh, it was a, 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 an almost extraordinary time. It was an explosion of talent that was there. Um, so fast forward 25 years, and we have um, one of the directors of the National Theatre, uh, the director of the Old Vic, on my first day, thinking I could act, and I'd given up at the National Youth Theatre. Um, absence of will and talent, but I thought I'd have another go, and I went to audition, uh, and on the first day, I thought, God, you know, I still got it, you know, can still fake it, and then somebody else went and got up and read exactly the same part, and it just sounded different insofar as it was authentic, and you could more than intuitively tell that that's exactly what the writer had intended. Um, I thought, well, <laughs> there you are. Uh, that turned out to be Benedict Cumberbatch. <laughs> so, um, who's still uh, one of my best friends today. And of course, also on my first day, I met my cousin uh, in Manchester, who's now a uh, fellow here of Keeble College, um, uh, whose lecture I went to listen to uh, a while ago at All Souls on medieval history. I didn't understand terribly much of it, but, uh, but there you are. The point was that every single night in Manchester then, you could go out and see extraordinary theatre of real range and depth. I think it was slightly different. In fact, perhaps it was extremely different in that the people that I knew at Manchester, by and in large, hadn't gone there because they had failed to get in elsewhere. It felt like a conscious choice. And there was a richness and a depth to both the academic and cultural and social life that was taking place, um, which I was just lucky to be there at the right place in the right time. That being said, um, speaking to some students tonight, I'm also um, incredibly and increasingly mindful that perhaps some of the reason for that was I left university with 900 pounds worth of debt almost nothing, it was free. And despite the way I sound, and so the consequent subconscious biases that people apply to me, making various assumptions. I come from a family, I was the first person to go to university from a, my uh, uh, mum was a single mother. And yet, as I say, uh, I managed to get there with almost no debt. 
And so the freedom that I'm describing to explore academically, not to go to lectures, to enjoy the richness of cultural life, um, were much more readily available and involved infinitely less risk than if I'd come out of university with 30, 40, 50,000 pounds worth of debt. So there you are. But it was fantastic. So that was Manchester, but I certainly wasn't educated at NYT. I, did, I was in, I was in um, Julius Caesar one year, and it was, on the G, it was on the GCSE syllabus. I was 16, and going through that rather sad, and I don't want to be fattest, but transitional phase, I'll put it that way. Mm. And my job was to be um, Lucius. Julius Caesar was played by Chiwetel Ejiofor. <laughs> yes, I mean, good actors. <laughs> and um, uh, I learned to play the lute for the part. Um, and they'd bring in GCSE students because it was on the syllabus. And I would play my little lute, um, some sort of... The, the director's, I suppose, thin, thinly veiled subconscious idea of some homoerotic relationship between me and Brutus. I have to tell you, having seen Brutus act, um, I suspect he was more of a bottom, but there you are. And <laughs> nevertheless, I sang my song. They would bring their young people in to watch this, and they would eat crisp packets. And one particular charming day, I'd finished my version of, I think it was called Dai Yung Sum Pan. I mean, it was just the worst form of cultural appropriation imaginable and bad, and I couldn't sing. And uh, as I got more nervous, I increasingly didn't fit into my slightly disturbing Aladdin outfit. <laughs> got to the end of my song, and um, this kid from the middle of the audience shouted out, which I thought was, well, one of my more vocal and sympathetic critics, yeah, that was terrible. Can you shut up, you fat bastard? So that was the end of that. <laughs> Back in the day, you could say those sorts of things, which um, <laughs> it, I don't encourage. Mm. So after all that acting experience, what drove you to go into law? Debating. Debating with everything. And I still encourage it. Um, and that's the answer. Debating, debating, debating. I, was, I got involved, um, first of all, uh, in Manchester in debating, and, and it had no tradition whatsoever. But I met um, uh, another person there who was interested in it, and we ended up having had no experience coming to our first Oxford uh, IV competition in, it must have been 95 or 96, I'm looking at Burn, it might have been 96, I would have thought. Um, and we didn't have an, a clue what we were doing. So much so, if anybody's involved in debating here, um, you're supposed to only offer points of information or challenge the other side. Uh, we were offering points of information to our own side. <laughs> we had no clue what we were supposed to be doing. Um, we were terrible. Uh, uh, but gradually, um, we, we learnt, and eventually by year three, we ended up in the final here and broke at Worlds. And I, I should be clear, I didn't consciously, again, because to some extent I'm increasingly persuaded as I think about it, because of the privilege of the absence of debt, of university being a broad experience, something where you were gifted, and I mean that in every sense of the word, the opportunity to explore ideas and what you might want to do. There wasn't this overwhelming urge, a desire, almost this forcible conscription to know that you had to arrive and leave and join a German bank. Because of that, um, the debating became very important. And I didn't consciously go into law. What happened was I ended up in this debating community where, I'm going to use this word, it's a filthy word, it's a curse word in television, it ought to be in any essay, right? But my journey <laughs> um, became inevitable because that's what people who were good at debating did. And I thought I'd be a good barrister. Eventually what happened, once I'd arrived um, at the bar, and I should say, I arrived at the bar having never, been, never seen a trial in my life, ever, or been to court. I don't think I've ever admitted that publicly, um, but it's, it's absolutely true. I worked hard in my undergraduate and got a first, and that really mattered, and it, it still does. Um, and I'd gone all the way through. I got pupillage, um, and any of you out here who are, who are lawyers, it has got even more competitive I can't tell you the precise numbers, but currently in my chambers, which is a leading, which I'm, I'm still a member of, they still allow me to uh, be a member of it, despite them all being kind of leading Treasury Council, dealing with the most complex work. Um, and last week I dealt with a case where a woman brought her dentist to court and I wanted to know where in the country it had taken place. So I said, um, Madam, where did you get your teeth done? And she said, in my mouth. So they still... <laughs> <laughs> they, 
they still allow me to, to, to practice. More about that in due course. Um, uh, 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 but we had 400 and something applicants, and we take about two, maybe one each year. That's, that's the level. That's how competitive it is. It was. When I went through uh, my application process, it wasn't as competitive. Certainly if you were, deba you were a debater, certainly if you had a first. Certainly, and this is another thing, what Oxbridge gave applicants the advantage of, and still does, is a tutorial system as an undergraduate. And the reason it's an advantage isn't because of the brand of Oxford, and that's certainly not the case. It's certainly the case now, where chambers are increasingly of, in my view, the correct approach, which is to be less mindful of institutions and to be more thoughtful about broad recruitment. But why the tutorial system enables applicants to have a broader range of experiences? Because you, from your first term here, are constantly challenged and confronted and having or forced to defend ideas, which is ostensibly what happens in pupillage interviews. So I went the way, I went all the way through and um, ended up in my first set of chambers, which was a, the chambers of the late Sir Desmond de Silva, um, who um, went on to become the chief war crimes prosecutor in Sierra Leone. Interestingly about him, he's one of the greatest advocates I've ever seen on his feet. And, um, one of the last generation, of which there are a huge number still practicing, they are slowly, sadly dying out, who never went anywhere near a university. When I first started, um, the advocates that are, were the most famous never had to have a university degree. You could simply do your bar exams. It's very interesting. And of those that I know, for example, my, my new chambers, and my new chambers being I've been there for 10 years, Orlando Pownall, who prosecuted every major terrorist and murder, murder case you could probably think of, he too hadn't gone to university. Um, uh, these are people whose depth, intellectual depth, range, judgment, and their capacity to understand the law is extraordinary. It's very interesting. Anyway, so I ended up at two paper buildings where I practiced first and foremost crime and then had a lucky break which is an unusual thing. Being a barrister back then, again, it's, it's changed a great deal. But you used to go to court, and I used to go to the magistrate's court doing standard stuff. And I got a particular, I suppose, niche of being gratuitously difficult to police officers. And there was a reason for that. They were trained rather differently back then. And um, on one particular occasion, I caught the eye of a rather life on Mars antediluvian cop. And I clocked him straight away, and we could feel each other's indifference. Well, my indifference to him, his loudly spoken but nevertheless subconscious homophobia towards me. So I thought that's going to be useful as a weapon. He came into court, my absolutely guilty client, allegedly, but was guilty, they were. <laughs> um, and um, gradually, slowly but surely, um, the defence was self defence. I found a way of getting more and more, him more and more cross, which is what he did. There were few questions. He was just furious, absolutely incandescent, at being cross-examined and questioned by somebody that was getting increasingly more camp. And also back then, I looked a lot younger too. What happened was that police officer left the witness box and punched the door. And there was a very impressed solicitor. Nobody comes aware out well of this story, but there you are. It was a very impressed solicitor um, called Muhammad Nasser, who made my career. Luck, all luck. He ha I happened to be in the right place at the right time, and that's a theme of my experience. This extraordinary way in which the universe has somehow conspired to assist me. And at the time, that was around 2003, 2004, uh, two young women had been killed outside of hairdressers on New Year's Eve in Birmingham. And it was the first ever drive-by shooting, certainly one that had been widely publicised. And the reason it had been widely pub publicised was because the gangs called the Burger Bar and the Johnson Crew, I don't know if there's anyone here from the Midlands or from Birmingham, but those are names, if you're from that part of the world, you'll know who they, what they, they, they are. They sound like <coughs> Grange Hill or bad after school specials, but they are and were uh, deeply serious and very violent gangs. Um, these two desperately unfortunate young people ended up in the crossfire between the two gangs. And Muhammad um, instructed me on that case when I was only four years cool. I was led by a QC who became one of my mentors 
and was one of the first openly gay members of the bar. Um, and from there, I ended up doing back-to-back -back work for about four or five years, chiefly defending in cases, in gang-related cases. And they're some of the cases that stay with me. And I am still still have um, ongoing relationships with some of their families. For example, I dealt with a case in 2006 called Dmitry Foskin. And it was, for lawyers out there, this is quite an interesting thing. You, you used to be able to run a defence of duress. It's now, for a variety of reasons, much more restricted and no longer available. Um, the case, I think, for lawyers out there is R and Z, which, which changed things. But ostensibly why that was an interesting case is that you would be able to say that if your life was at risk, you had a, a much more broad defence to any criminal allegation. What happened in this particular case was there was intelligence. My client at the time had an IQ of 98, which placed him just within the acceptable normal range. His mother was a hard-working nurse, but his sister was involved with a person called Calvin Grant at the time, was the ostensible head of the Johnson crew. There was intelligence, there was guns all over the house. They raided the house, they know there weren't mums, but they arrested mum and they arrested, they arrested Dimitri. Cut a very long story short, I knew for sure, just as mum did, that he was under duress and didn't willingly go and do this. But he faced an appalling catch, uh, an, an appalling catch 22 five-year mandatory minimum. Given the nature of the weaponry, he probably would have got 10 years. I should add he was 19, by the way. And so we had to come up with a form of words, and the answer was he had to run duress. Now, why that's interesting is going back to the Burger Bar case, just to give you a sense of how serious it was. In fact, again, it created a very important legal change. In the course of the proceedings, there were two informant witnesses who were giving evidence, eyewitness evidence, critical eyewitness evidence. All of that's changed now. Eyewitnesses no longer matter in the way that they used to. Um, who were uh, effectively involved and gang members. However, <coughs> the defendants, and this will be very interesting to any American jurists here, the defendants were specifically precluded from seeing the defendants, from seeing the relevant witnesses, also, the evidence was given through the medium of voice distortion equipment and, just to offend those who are constitutionally minded who are American, um, we as lawyers were also injuncted from giving any details, uh, identifying details that might have led to the identification of the witnesses who subsequently ended up in witness protection. But that's how serious it was. So we come back to Dimitri and he's in a very difficult position because he's defending, he's... A, he's, he's on trial, he doesn't have all of the statutory protections, powers, infrastructure to look after him. He has to name the person who's a subject and source of the duress that caused him to have all of these guns in the house. So we, he, me and mum agreed a form of words, and you can't coach witnesses, another surprising and I think rather good thing here compared to America. But nevertheless, he gave evidence very well. It's all usually a very easy defence to run because, of course, you call all the prosecution witnesses, most of whom are police officers, and all you want to do is to persuade the jury correctly, authentically and truly how challenging their work is and how dangerous the gang are. The form of words we agreed was that he wouldn't name individuals, he would just name the gang. He gave evidence correctly, truly, very persuasively, and he was acquitted, he just named the gang, that's all. That was on the Monday after I'd persuaded him that that was a correct course of action. Otherwise, he was facing 10 years in jail. So I think the acquittal came on Tuesday morning. And on Thursday evening, I had a telephone call from his mum to say he'd been shot dead outside of his house. And I spoke at his funeral two weeks later. And that probably, was four years in, was the kind of epiphany moment. And it's strange it took that long for me to realise what I was doing and why. Up to that point, I'd been a debater doing law then it became something more substantial. And then from there, I ended up doing, um, I moved chambers and had a more international focus for a variety of reasons. Chiefly, I'll be entirely honest with you, because um, it, didn't, it no longer became viable to practice in legal aid, financially viable. 
just to give you an instance, I think it's important to put, to, uh, especially as you are young consumers of education now in a way that I never was, um, a, a case that I first did, a complex fraud trial, five years into practice, which would have taken hundreds of hours to prepare, would be worth £40,000 or thereabouts. An almost identical case, which was a critical moment in my decision making to change the type of law I practiced, same sort of publicly funded case, identical practically in every conceivable way in the, in the nature of the offences on the indictment, the complexity, all the rest of it. Same case was worth, by the time I changed and altered my, the type of law I practiced, was worth four and a half thousand pounds. And it gets worse, and the stranglehold on legal aid lawyers becomes even tighter. And the consequence is dire. And it's dire because although my chambers continues to practice in criminal defence and in legal aid, Barn and we've negotiated the commercial turbulence of it, Barn in large, uh, we've moved out of it. So I practiced, I wrote a book about uh, money laundering, which I became sort of slightly interested in. It's a veritable thrill ride of a book. When the publishers said, well, who would you like to dedicate it to? I suggested that they just simply say, do not operate heavy machinery. It's... Um, and from there, I ended up doing international law. There's no such thing as international law. And of course, any lawyer will tell you, I hope that you are always sceptical and always nervous if anybody says, I'm an international lawyer. It's a bit like being a human rights lawyer. There's no such thing. It's just a way of either being Bridget Jones or somehow getting a date with somebody, as far as I can gather. What does that even mean? It meant that there was an international emphasis on the criminal law that I practiced. So amongst other things, one of the interesting cases I got was in 2010, the Turks and Caicos Islands. Um, I didn't know where it was. I didn't know what it was. The only reason I'd ever heard of it was because I used to watch Miss World. Um, <laughs> I also should say, just for gender balance, that years ago there used to be, I'm not sure there are still, Panini football stickers where you could collect teams. Um, you were supposed to allegedly put them in order of team, you know, so you had a complete set of Tottenham sadly, or, or whatever your team was. I never used to do that. I used to have my uh, Panini football stickers in order of attractiveness, <laughs> which, was, which was quite something. Mm. Sad, but nevertheless true. Um, so it's Watch Miss World. That's the only reason I'd heard of it. But cut a long story short, their government, it's very interesting. It's one of the last pink bits, one of the last hangovers. Um, as some of you may know, there are about 13 jurisdictions which are de facto colonies of the UK, from Gibraltar to Bermuda to the Turks and Caicos Islands, Montserrat, etc. And they all have a nuanced constitutional relationship with the UK. The Turks and Caicos Islands is a very interesting one. Ostensibly what happened is that the corruption got out of hand and it's very close to America and they were getting, for a variety of reasons, increasingly nervous. We were getting increasingly embarrassed that so they had a public inquiry under... Uh, Lord Justice Auld, and he made three recommendations to suspend local democracy, in other words, recolonise the place, to appoint a civil team to get the land back that had been effectively, um, well, it had been obtained through corruption, and to appoint a special prosecutor, and for two counsel to advise that special prosecutor. Well, that was me. I don't know how I got the job. Um, I thought, a, a bit like as I'm listening and hearing to first-year law students, in fact, first-year students in general, I had totally over-romanticised what it was going to look like. You know, I think as I listen and, and, and have had the chance and gift of hearing first-year law students and how depressed they all are, I'm, I'm completely... <laughs> in fact, first-year students, including my wonderful chosen goddaughter, Alice Warner, who's here tonight, and I'm immensely proud of, and I'm going to embarrass her at every single opportunity. But I think part of that depression is once you get into Oxbridge, there's this sense in which there's this sort of joyous moment, and then you spend the rest of the summer curating this over-romanticised idea about how fabulous it's going to be, as if you're going to be somehow smoking in Brideshead, thinking about ponderous ohms by Herodotus and having a huge amount of loose sex, when of course <laughs> it just doesn't turn out like that at all. And so much of both pre professional and personal depression, uh, I feel increasingly confident, exists in that chasm between how you've curated and the narrative you've told, the way in which you've approached the world in a romantic way, which you almost certainly can't control, and the reality. So I imagined this was going to be a fabulous job. And it was at first, it was a nice beach, <laughs> but after that, it, um, it, 
it, it became pretty challenging pretty quickly. I learned an enormous amount. For example, um, it was the first time I had ever prosecuted a serious case. And that became very important to me in what happened in television. Um, and why it was interesting is that we got a bunch of police officers from the UK for a variety of important reasons, not because there was wholesale corruption in the local police force, but because self-evidently, given um, uh, the prosecutorial branches of government had been suspended, it was important we had an independent investigation. But all of the police officers, or a good swathe of them that had been instructed, employed, were retired police officers, some in their 60s, some in their 50s, some uh, of those of you who will know about the 1980s policed all grieve from West Yorkshire, South Yorkshire, um, certainly they'd never met anybody like me. And they spent a good deal of their time, certainly one or two of them in the first three or four weeks, ostensibly trying to get sa me sacked. And at least on three occasions, finding corners in, of the room because they were desperately concerned that I was sexually interested in them. The fact, frankly, that frankly, if the world had been flooded with piss, I, the, they would be the last people I would have sex with. <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't matter. What, taught, what it taught me was this. We ended up becoming um, very close and great friends. Um, th this community of, young, of, of, of older police officers, it turned out, had never met anybody like me. Um, and as long as, and in every case, it happened, they were prepared to give me the opportunity and chance to demonstrate what I could do for them. Um, they gave me the grace to work alongside them. And by the way, that started in 2010. It's now 2019, and the trial, the prosecution, still hasn't closed its case. It's now in its 10th year. From there, I then left Turks and Caicos and um, handed over to my roommate in Chambers. Um, and then what happened, I got so bored and also quite ill. By ill, I mean depressed, that I had um, absolutely lost the passion, the love and the belief in the job. And there were two reasons for that. One was um, because of the travel, but most importantly, because I, at that time, certainly, was investing all of my emotional currency and capital into a system and into um, a job that I didn't feel, A, I was up to, and B, I didn't believe in the outcome, in the process itself. And if you get up every morning and you don't have the passion to do it, you end up bankrupt fairly quickly, and I was pretty bereft. Uh, that was exacerbated pretty badly when I ended up in Croydon. Now, I know Mo is here tonight and from Croydon. Um, it's no offence to Croydon, but Mo, I have to say, when I read the Betjeman poem, Come Happy Bombs and Rain on Slough, I suspect it's because nothing rhymed with Croydon, to be honest with you. <laughs> but at that time, I was um, defending in a case, and it was for a man who was the largest um, smuggler of female sex slaves in Europe, and a sociopath. Um, and I found myself investing, as I say, all of my intellectual, emotional, personal capital into this job where I'd spent four or five years building a prosecution case. And I no longer had, it's a lovely Yiddish word, the koyach, the capacity, the capacity, the desire to continue, and so felt every morning perpetually bankrupt. On around the same time, um, I was appointed in Jersey. There was an independent Jersey care inquiry into child abuse, Haute de la Grande Children's Homes, where they found children's skulls, and there was a press conference Incidentally, the children's skulls in that case never have a press conference early. Turned out to be two coconuts, but there you are. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, there was wholesale abuse. And because there weren't, there weren't, as there aren't in similar jurisdictions, separation between the prosecutorial branches of government and the legislative branches of government, they needed independent counsel to um, effectively manage the disclosure process so the public could have confidence that we would hand over, or rather the government would hand over all of their documents, relevant documents. So that's what I was doing. At about the time, I was writing scripts because I was terribly bored and it made me less depressed. And cut a long story short, I went to take one of these scripts into a woman called Helen Warner, who's vaguely related to Alice Warner, happens to be her mum, who was a legend of television. 
um, and is one of the bluntest people you'll ever met, also um, one of the most creatively rich people you'll ever meet. And there was just instant, well, there was an instant connection. And she said it was, I think, the worst script or the worst thing she'd ever seen. She gave it her aggressively undivided indifference. Um, but it turned out she'd written a rather brilliant book. So I took it home and I, I read it. And from Croydon, when I was supposed to be defending my client, who I think might be out of prison, I hope not, <laughs> um, um, I did a short review of her book. And she said to me, um, she wrote back going, there's this guy in Manchester who um, is interested in doing a court TV show. Are you qualified to sit as an arbitrator? And for a variety of reasons, I felt I was, I was. But it was television, and because it's television, and as I have come to discover, and is the truth in television, or people in media in general, most of the time, um, they say things of little value because it's all bollocks. Mm -hmm. It has absolutely, n they ostensibly spend a good deal of the creative capital going to meetings and nothing more. Turns out Helen Warner was not one of those people. And generally speaking, the germ of the idea of getting somebody on television who's never been on television takes roughly two to sometimes three years by the time you've been screen tested. Helen said, well, I'll just give you 20 shows in the summer. At that time, I was in Jersey doing this very serious case. And I arrived in Manchester as I, again, not really having any confidence in television, thinking that it was all nothing more than mindless and certainly um, shallow thought, to a courtroom with my name on it. I thought, good Lord. <laughs> and that's what happened. The first case I dealt with, again, massive learning, but pure luck, rich, extraordinary luck, the universe conspiring to assist you. First case I dealt with, a woman came in and I said, oh, I'm so glad you're here and, and obviously you're, you're here with your mother, that's my sister. <laughs> the second case changed everything and was probably one of the most important moments in my political life, actually. It's one that I remember. Uh, we are, they are all real cases and for a variety of reasons we are very heavily regulated by Ofcom. And so for that purpose, although people speak in my ear, um, they aren't allowed at any stage to interfere with any of the legal integrity, either of the questions and certainly not of the judgment. My executive producer is this incredible person from Wolverhampton, brilliant person. And it was case two or three, and a woman was suing somebody else for, I think it was, 90 pounds. And I said, ah, oh, 90 pounds, well, that's not a lot of money. Do you want to rephrase that? You sound like a ride posh dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> and I should tell you from that moment, that was, you know, there we've had, you say, Sister Wendy and Oprah, that gives you my cultural range. But a, a critical aha moment, despite having practiced for years, and I do mean years, but in crime, that's very important. Um, I, I learnt and continue to learn about the lives of people outside of the privileges of cities um, and just the broad range of community experiences that we don't have that I'm afraid to say we first learnt of, we first heard, and by we I'm making assumptions about people in this room at the moment I use the word we, I learnt of in the Brexit vote, but I knew having dealt with case after case of people's lives and what was going on. So that was, and then it basically rained and um, it became popular. And people like you in television when you're popular. And so from there, um, you end up getting, as when things are going away, a whole range of opportunities. And then we now make crime stories, um, which I'm enormously proud of. It's in its fifth series. And... Um, what we do, in fact, I came to, I, I just did a voiceover for one of them now. What we do is we give a platform, uh, and m most importantly, and most especially, editorial control to the families of victims who want to tell their stories, and also to the police officers who solved crimes. And there's a variety of reasons why that's important. Uh, too difficult and complex to go into, but very often what happens, say, for example, in the case of a murder, the family are very often robbed of the agency and of the control of the memory, a and just about every vestige of the humanity of that family member, even the photograph that you see that comes to be emblematic and synonymous of the victim, they have no choice over. 
So we give them that opportunity to tell that story. It's now in its fifth season. And of all of the stories we're telling this year, they all come from other victims' groups. And it's been a quite campaigning show. And then I answer readers' questions, and I have done for five years, legal questions in the sun every week. And that's an enormous discipline. Um, and such a gift, such a gift to hear, really hear, that's a very different word from listening to, the range of legal issues that people are facing and how the world is experienced and approached and the prisms through which huge swathes of our communities are living their lives. That, I do a um, column in the sun. I'm about to do a chat show on Channel 4. I don't know what it's about. I think it's just going to be, as far as I can gather, filth, a bit like Clive James. <laughs> But also um, the thing that I'm involved in at the moment, in fact, in the middle of, uh, last year I did a Who Do You Think You Are, which was about my family's story and about my grandfather who was a Holocaust survivor and um, the 732 refugees who, having survived the Holocaust, came to Windermere and other parts of England. Um, and the good news about that wasn't just that it won a BAFTA, but also BBC have now... Um, commissioned a three-part series, and um, I'm in the middle of, of making that. It's a story about the Holocaust, but most especially it's a story about um, the Holocaust through the prism of Western Europe. And that's a complex discussion, better answered by Simon Sharma than me. But one of the things I've been troubled by, which also connects to perhaps Brexit and my experience in court and the way in which we're increasingly unable and fail to listen to one another, is I'm despite the story that I'm telling, my personal story, which takes place in Eastern Europe, one of the things that's, very fascin one of the things that's fascinating to me is, is how we tell the story of the Holocaust and its significance. And it's very often, if not commonly told, uh, through the experiences of Eastern Europe, and it's become an Eastern European story. And very often it's presented, perhaps through the first time, through the alienating, an alienated prism of black and white, I think be it because you see Schindler's List, be it because, frankly, the largest number of victims were in Eastern Europe. One of the challenges about that is that that subsequently, or consequently rather, becomes, it allows the part of your brain, the vestige of your brain that contains the logical and emotional hemisphere to respond in this way, that it feels like an explosion of violence between two unassimilated communities. And one of the problems of that and the mission of the, uh, of the documentary I'm making at the moment is that that absolves the responsibility of the West. And of course, uh, what happened, we forget, is that <coughs> this hate emerged against a backdrop of the most evolved democracy as it was in the world. None of us would have felt especially uncomfortable in Weimar in 1931. It would have been rather fabulous, like Shoreditch. Universal health care, well, not sure, we don't want any of those vile hips, you know, people with jobs. <laughs> and no startups and people who haven't been on gap yards and that sort of thing. But <laughs> nevertheless, we wouldn't have felt special discomfort. Um, it, you, you access by and large, not wholesale, but certainly access to abortion, women's rights, all of those things. All of the veneers of democracy and what it took was the right historical conditions. I don't need to tell you, this is not an A-level discussion, right? You know, the, 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 the memory of a treaty which feels, felt like you got a bad deal versus ah, fast forward to um, economic meltdown, fast forward to a compelling, charismatic leader with the right message and the right communities to blame. And then, and this is a thing, and this is what motivated me in that aha moment I was talking about in law, the incremental removal of the rule of law. It never starts in one go. It's first of all, you can't come to work if you, or we're going to have different rules for our Muslim brothers and sisters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so the stories we're telling are going to be, hopefully, if not exclusively located in Western Europe, to remind ourselves about the complacency of democracy. And I'm super excited about it. And the good news is, when you put this stuff on television, loads of people watch it, and there's almost no backlash on social media, none. It's really fascinating. The Who Do You Think You Are that we did, um, I'm about to say I sound like Donald Trump, but there you are. Um, um, it, 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 I don't think actually, no, no, I certainly don't. Um, <laughs> the, in, in this sense, it was um, 
the highest rated, who do you think you are, that they'd, they'd ever had, by a mile. And it certainly wasn't anything to do with me. I mean, Boy George was on it. I mean, you know, most people, frankly, didn't know who I was unless they'd seen Strictly, more about that in a second. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? I mean, they're not at home at two o'clock, not unless they're, well, lots of, well, not say this, but you know, a good number of, some people are unemployed. I have a lot of very, very, well, I'm, I'm extremely fond of my pharmaceutical heroin user um, fans who write regularly. But they didn't know who I was. But it was a programme well made about history. And um, it seemed to resonate, which was a really good news story, actually. So that's it. And then, of course, there was Strictly, which was the best thing ever. It is I was the, going to come on to that. The what? best thing ever. There is, look, there is no downside. There is, I mean, first of all, I'm an egomaniac, which helps. So there should have been a moment, and I'm not sure this is true in the life of every barrister, but I suspect it kind of is, especially criminal barristers who are, despite their complaints, <coughs> performers to a limited extent. You can't perform to a jury. If a jury thinks you're acting or being inauthentic, it's over. But they're still performers. And again, I've not admitted this publicly, but I don't think there's any... Well, I've written about it, certainly, and I have this column in The Standard where I write whatever I want. There, there was never a moment when the first time somebody wanted a selfie, I thought, goodness me, wasn't that odd? It, it was just happening in real life as opposed to my own brain, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Which is troubling, but there you are. Um, when I did Strictly, I mean, you get all of these sort of producers trying to kind of conscript you into this terror. Don't get me wrong, the first time I was a bit nervous, but I was like, well, you know, I've been in Sierra Leone dealing with, you know, war crimes, so no one died. It's just jazz hands, <laughs> which is when I had to give up practice, actually. That was, I was practicing for two years up to that point, but I was still advising in the Jersey case, and I realized, because I'd written the policy, there might be a problem if the um, High Court judge in the case that was sitting as the commissioner had asked if they'd gone, if there'd been some fundamental problem with the policy, um, and whose dumb idea was it not to serve this vast <laughs> wadge of very important, relevant material? The answer was, well, uh, he, he's off doing the foxtrot. <laughs> it might not have gone down very well, but it was an absolute joy. It was the best thing ever. I mean, sequins, free dancing lessons, What's not to like? Darcy Barcel was a... This is being filmed. She was wonderful. <laughs> no, no. She was, it was all fun. I mean, my only thing was, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a Russian. I love Russian literature and I learnt Russian. In fact, I just interviewed somebody in Belarus and very badly. But I like, you know, it's a thing I'm interested in. And I wanted to keep up my Russian language. So even though, you know, there's that... For anybody who watched Strictly, there's that first episode where you meet your dance partner. And you're, you're supposed to be very surprised. Well, of course, I'd already said, I definitely want the Russian. You know, and because I wanted to practice, I thought, great, it's a chance I can talk about Pushkin and all the things that I'm really interested in. Because they give you three weeks before you sling, they sling you out. So even if I wasn't very good, I thought, what a great opportunity to, you know, have a practice. So there was that moment where I went, ah, you know, great surprise. Oh, on that note, I should add, one of the delights of television is I've never been conscripted and will never be conscripted ever, in t ever. Uh, and it's a gift, I think, of not mine, but of the teams I work in, despite the nature of the cases which some people may believe are inauthentic, but they're not. I've never been conscripted into saying something I've not wanted to say or hasn't been wholly true, except on one occasion, which was in the pre-filming to um, Strictly, I found myself down the lens with all the lights shining at me, all of the glitter everywhere. I thought, I mean, there was just this, this overwhelming camp explosion, like Liza was going to manifest at any moment. And I found myself staring down the lens of the camera, saying, my whole life, all I've ever wanted to do is get to Blackpool. <laughs> <laughs> and no, if other people don't, you know, in Blackpool, I've ever met somebody this evening from Blackpool, I think, um, don't want to be in Blackpool, although it's lovely. Um, <laughs> so first week, I meet Oksana, and I thought, brilliant, and we have a bit of a practice in Russian, and she's very exciting, and we go from um, the studios, which is in um, Elstree, up to my house in Islington, we pass Highgate Cemetery. Well, this is the moment I'm in. We've just, we've just got commonality, right? So Oksana, I say, you know who's buried there? No, she says. <laughs> she wasn't invited back the following year. She's a very lovely person, very strict. She's, um, she's doing other things. I'm not sure what she's doing this winter. I intuitively suspect she might be invading Poland, but there you are. Um, <laughs> um, she, I said, do you know who's buried here? She said, no, I said, Karl Marx. Slightly. He 
he is a singer? <laughs> so that was the end of our cultural discussion, but it was great. <laughs> you know, I, I'd go in and I'd go and um, veto Louise Redknapp's outfits and that sort of thing. And the best thing that happened was that we didn't have, we were a lucky year because there were no people occupying the same space. So we became genuine friends. You sort of united in the experience. And um, I became close to Will Young and especially Greg Rutherford, who's spoken here. And part of the reason for that is I'm not suggesting for a second that the public art, there's a, a disingenuous way that um, Strictly is dealt with. Not for a second. I'm not suggesting, for example, and I certainly have no bitterness about it, I mean that authentically. I'm not suggesting for a second that the vast majority of people who take part in it have danced since they're three years old. But I will say, <laughs> arriving on the first day, I was standing there and it looked like a scene, this won't mean a lot to, well, any of you, but you'll get a general sense of it. Um, it looked like a scene from fame or from stage school. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. Uh, you know, there were pleading and goodness knows what else. Um, y y y and, and I sort of had the choreographic range of an airline salad. So this is what, you know, all I had was a desire to learn jazz hands and a range of sex faces. That's pretty much all I could. <laughs> Um, but Greg Rutherford sort of sidled up to me and was sort of looking at this in front of him unfold and said, um, I think we should get out of here. And so we ended up spending the rest of the time in a pub getting drunk pretty much. But it was an absolute delight. Free lessons. There is no downside thing. None of it. It's all, all of it fantastic. <laughs> it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. And I, I've written about this a lot. And like I say, I have friends who have gone on to certainly actors, to superstar them. And I don't necessarily direct what I say towards them because they have families. And so perhaps that puts them in a different position. Um, but the constant delight and privilege of having people stop you in the street and ask for a selfie, and you get to improve the chemistry of their day by virtue of doing absolutely <coughs> nothing. Any celebrity of any description from whatever walk of life that has the grotesque temerity to complain about that should go and do what my father does, which is work for 45 years as a black taxi driver, or go and do another job. There are plenty others if they want. Um, but I'm afraid to say, despite, and I understand, you know, you, you expect people to be polite, and yes, there are limits and in invasions of privacy, as I say, particularly when people are with their children. But by and large, including if you're an actor, you can curate your life sufficiently to live it perfectly privately. But if you're in the street and a fan politely comes up to you and asks for a selfie or an autograph, you have an absolute, and I mean an absolute, obligation to do that. Um, and I'm afraid to say that this industry, the one that I work in now, despite it being populated by the most talented, emotionally and intellectually literate group of people I've ever worked with, especially and including the law, by the way, also includes talent who, because of the way the industry is set up, have had their, frankly, their moral chemistry interfered with because the industry is set up in a way which enables terrible behaviours, including complaining about fans wanting selfies and people being allowed to forget the extraordinary range of not just privileges, but entitlements you get for doing absolutely bugger all. And I have absolutely no time for that complaint whatsoever at all. It's fantastic. It's brilliant. Uh, and when I do think about that, and if I am having a bad day, I think to myself when I was doing terrorist cases or murder trials, and especially at the Nadir, feeling desperately depressed, getting up in the morning depleted, that that's where I could be. So it's an absolute delight. I recommend it. <laughs> Go on Love Island. <laughs> <laughs> Only, hopefully, where they have a more imaginative and thoughtful um, range of bodies than they do this year. Um, does anyone watch Love Island? It's all about, I mean, it's just, it's just soft pornography, isn't it? I mean, uh, <laughs> my, um, who I promised I wouldn't mention, but she is rather brilliant in here, Alice Warner, my... Is she here? She wrote her, um, I, I sent it round to everybody because I'm obsessed with it. Um, she wrote her EPQ, her extended essay in at secondary school, and I love it, comparing Love Island to um, Jane Austen. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
that's one of still one of the most persuasive pieces of work I've ever seen. So very well. um, um, questions. So interrupt, but on that note, I think it's time to move on to mm. audience questions. So if you have a question, please. Well, I'll answer hand. anything honestly, completely. <laughs> I have. Um, yeah. Could we go to the hand in the back, please? Will you say your name, please, if that's right? Sorry. Thanks very much. Hi, I'm Charlie. Thank you for Hi, speaking Charlie. today. It's been really, really brilliant to hear. Um, I was interested, um, I was glad to hear about your um, column. I had to write it down because I was thinking of it, as you said it, but you've yeah. changed a lot of topics. But anyway, um, <laughs> I, I was thinking about your, your column um, offering answering legal questions in the sun. Mm. Um, and there's also, I, I don't read the sun, I'm afraid, but there is a page on Reddit where people um, answer legal questions. And most of the replies start with, I am not a lawyer, but mm. blah, blah, blah. Um, and I know, you know, some very basic practices like keeping my receipts or, you know, checking the, the things in a house before I move in. Right. But on, you know, rights and responsibilities in the gig economy or knowing the difference between like slander and just calling someone a moron. I don't know. Right. I, I don't know those things. So yeah. who would you say is responsible for providing that kind of information Such a good question. to the general public? It's a really, really thoughtful question. Um, and um, it, 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 it's a very, very difficult one to answer. The, the, the answer is that there is no answer, and that's why lawyers exist, because some of the laws you're talking about are by their very nature very complex, but lots of them are not. Everybody should understand the fundamental ingredients of a contract. For example, you should know whether or not you have an intention to create legal relations. Very interesting difference between us and the States, by the way. Um, you, you should know that. And in fact, that's one of the gifts that I've been able to share with the million or so people that watch every day. I just want to touch on one thing that you brought up there, which is super interesting, because it's about the court that I sit in, however frivolous some people may think it is. Um, just because you mentioned slander. One of the big issues that happens nowadays is that small businesses are often not just um, affected, but destroyed by a bad review. Very often that review is false. There is absolutely no remedy, or certainly hardly any remedy, for a small business to bring a claim against that, app, against that sort of slander. And the reason for that, as the lawyers in the room will know, is because defamation is exclusively the tool of the rich. It has to be <coughs> in the high court and over 50,000 and forget about it. I had a case the other week involving a man that ran a kennel. It had been independently assessed by the RSPCA and the council had all of the licenses, a woman. Um, who had her dog back. She absolutely believed that it had been starved whilst in the kennels. I had an independent vet in court who confirmed that that was just one of the consequences of a, vet, of a dog being in kennels. She wrote a review, effectively calling him a dog killer. He had no remedy. Malicious falsehood, possibly. Certainly, he couldn't have brought that in the small claims court for a variety of reasons. No legal aid for him. Certainly, it's a complex case to bring. And a lot of what she said, she reasonably believed to be true, so wouldn't have fallen, fallen within the strictures of slander. Defamation, I should say. Really problematic. And yet, uh, we are the only court uh, that's dealing with cases like that. The answer is everybody should understand the law. And um, one of the real challenges of writing the Sun Answers every week, in fact, I'm going to do them tonight, and it's an amazing discipline, is trying to frame complex legal issues down to 200 words. And it's enormously difficult to do. And I should also add, for those of you that are going for interviews, especially if you're interested in becoming lawyers, what we found for a long time when we were over-emphasising academic qualifications for potential pupillage was that applicants, although incredibly intellectually rich, were the least able to do that. And it enormously, enormously, it matters in the most profound and articulate sense. No, it matters in the most important sense that anybody can understand the law. Um, there are, however, some issues which are just too difficult for people to manage on their own. Issues involving wills and trusts, for example. Very often issues involving land. Um, certainly there are criminal issues where it's inadvisable, very often inadvisable to represent yourself. Etc. But you should understand that. Um, sadly, the reason we're in the problem, the reason, well, sadly, despite that, um, there is almost no legal aid available in civil law. 
which means it's even more important that people like on Reddit, who I, I don't know, but I, mean, I know what Reddit is, but if you're a young lawyer, that you are part of that discussion group contributing good quality information to forums like that to assist people. It's really hard to do, though. It's really, really challenging. So it's, it's um, you know, and sometimes the easiest cases end up, I mean, uh, uh, we've had cases that look like they're totally bonkers, right, in, in my court, which are the type of questions that I would set as an essay question to somebody, but they're totally mad really hard to describe. Everybody should be able to understand the law and everybody should have access to justice and sadly it's been increasingly um, corroded and um, removed. There you are. Is there another question? Yes. Could we go to the hand on the end of that row please? Oh. Oh. Hi, Hi me. What's Hello. your name? Uh, my name's Neil. Hi Neil. Could you stand up? Oh. Oh. Hi, I'm Neil. Hi, Neil. Thank you very much for giving up yeah. some of your time this evening. It's a joy. To us. Um, I'd like to be cheeky enough to ask two questions and maybe give you the opportunity to choose which one. Is it work experience? Because <laughs> uh, that's what I normally... <laughs> uh, do you want um, to be many here? The yeah. first thing I'd like to ask yeah. is, um, who have you met in your life that you've been most starstruck by? Oh, my God, that's a great question. The second, the second which you may consider that's possibly such, answering. Sasha, I have Sasha Judd here, who's um, a great debater and was uh, a partner in law firm and... Um, gives these incredible talks you should all re, uh, uh, watch about uh, tech sector and diversity. And I've written a column about being starstruck by Harry Styles, but I've got better ones, so do carry so on. Starstruck, right. yeah. and um, potentially, yeah. this is slightly cheeky, no, um, the naughtiest thing you've ever done. Wow. <laughs> Such good questions. Um, <laughs> right. So starstruck is a strange one, because there's two types of starstruck, right? There's a the sexual star starstruck, right? <laughs> I'm useless. I, I can't close the deal. I'll be absolutely clear about that. I can't date. I don't know how to talk to people I like. Um, I was recently... Um, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm looking at Sasha. I'm going to tell this story anyway. Um, <laughs> I've written about it, so it's OK. Just, just two instances of it. Um, I go to this gym called Barry's Boot Camp, and it's you know, completely in the dark. You probably know where it is. And, and it, there's lots of celebrities that go there, Beckham, and I don't care. I'm not in the least bit interested. And it's curated, I use that word in a way, it's lit in a way where, uh, you, you know, nobody really looks at anybody else, and they very consciously don't. Um, but because of my friend Sasha and this amazing talk that she writes, I, I can see her getting cross as I'm appearing to blame her for this. I've got increasingly... Um, not the word excited, but I, I, I rather liked Harry Styles. Not because I fancied him in any way, just because I, he seemed, you know, very talented and I like what he's doing and I, I think he's having interesting uh, uh, explorational discussions about gender and stuff. And I think he's great. But that wasn't it. That's not what did it, right? Um, what happened was that I was in Barry's boot camp and I saw him come into class. Somebody had his spot. And he's mega famous, right? And um, he just went outside, he allowed, you know, he had no sense of entitlement. Then, then, um, he started helping um, all of the um, custodial staff with the towels and taking out the rubbish. I was so overwhelmed by his kindness that any of my close friends will tell me, I need to be generally where people are not, because it's this sort of cascade of what can only be, I mean, described as the type of language that you would hear as really good evidence before the section proceedings. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm standing outside speaking to Harry and I said, oh, because I, you know, we've said hi because you're sort of a bit famous. So you go, hi, hi, hi. Um, and it started going, gosh, you know, you're so well brought up, Harry. You know, it's what a nice thing you did. And I said, I'd love to have a child like you. God, if, if I had a child, it would, it would be on crack by the time it was 10. <laughs> And so, not satisfied leaving it there, I said, well, actually, um, oh, you know, gosh, I should have a child. Is, is your mum single? <laughs> and very sadly, um, his mum said, actually, my stepfather passed away uh, not long ago. Um, and I said, oh, good, well, that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's, th we, we, we should do that. It'll be absolutely perfect. I'm going to have a young Harry Styles. <laughs> and so on and so forth. Until... He sort of looked at me, the only time I've ever seen somebody do this, a sort of peritonitis grey, was my first driving examiner. <laughs> and um, a, a friend of ours, Sasha and I, described it as social euthanasia. He's such a kind person. Um, he hugged me, see, <laughs> to make it stop. It's a really interesting thing in answer to your question. Because, I suppose, because Benedict and friends I know have become sort of famous actors, I'm never impressed or starstruck by actors. I mean, apart from Andrew Scott at the BAFTAs. 
but who isn't? I mean, um, I took a photo of us on his phone um, and then sent it to myself um, from his phone saying, um, uh, uh, OK, then I'll marry you. <laughs> and I wrote back going, I think that's a bit too soon. I'm still waiting for a response, to be honest. But, um, but I'm not really impressed by actors because I, I, you know, I've met them. And, you know, it's a bit like um, a dowager duchess, um, you know, uh, Maggie Smith in Gosford Park, you know, who has Ivan Novello. And so the problem is with somebody famous is after the initial flush of recognition, you know, there's not much there, really. So I was never really starstruck by um, those sorts of people. The people I was starstruck by were people who were famous when I was a kid. You know, I mean, that's the big stuff, and some of this won't mean anything to you. But, you know, the first moment when Andy Peters, who was in the broom cupboard, says hi to you, you know, again, I can see the sort of, you know, this, this who um, a, a, a creeping across this one, but it was like the coolest thing ever. Um, and I didn't do well um, in, in that conversation. It's really those people, you know, Joan Collins, who I met, who said hi, that I giggled for a, 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 a long period of time. I suspect Sasha could tell me a list of people that I've been embarrassing in front of. But it's, it's because it's important to remember that television, when I was growing up, represented a totally different thing from what it is now, where it's totally fragmented on different platforms, where you don't, generally speaking, other than in big events, and they're few and far between, like Game of Thrones, and really important soap operas and Love Island, Hugely significant. Never sneer at them, right? They really matter. But people don't watch television in that way. They used to when I was growing up, right? Um, just to give you a, 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 an idea, you know, we're talking about 20 million people would tune into EastEnders. Now, it's massive still, but it gets 4 million, 5 million. That's the change. Um, so everybody was having this shared experience. So when I meet people who, you know, were on Grange Hill, again, none of us, that, that's, that's who I'm excited by, right? I mean, it's just super excited. I saw Biggins in the airport the other day. Nearly had a coronary. There you are. <laughs> it's, it's, I think, I'm looking, thank you very much. It's like a little sort of quasi, not in your case, middle-aged support group here. <laughs> where we sort of, those, those, those are the people. Oh, and, and, and writers. I don't do well. But then very often I'll just go up to people and say, look, I'm not going to do well in this discussion. There's no point. I saw Dermot O'Leary the other day. Too hot. There was no way we were going to have a good chat. <laughs> It was going to be a disaster, so I just walked away. Uh, uh, Emma Thompson, super excited by her. I got, a, I got a pep talk from Sasha before I met her. Now, you're not in any way to say anything embarrassing. I think my friends describe me as when I meet somebody I am starstruck by, unembarrassed, as being like um, Hugh Grant on acid. <laughs> so it's those that people who I admire um, in some way, usually because of childhood, or... I have to say, uh, more commonly because they were lawyers or activists. Uh, recently, I took um, Peter Tatchell out for dinner, for example, um, and I know I wasn't listening to a word he said. I was just, it was Peter Tatchell, and it was just the coolest thing ever. Um, it wasn't actually the coolest dinner, I can't, you know, he, but, but, but there you are. Um, never meet people that you, I think also really never meet people, especially writers, especially writers. They are always disappointing. <laughs> the worst. Sorry to jump in oh. here, but we're almost running out oh, of time. Oh, sorry. Any so more questions about any? I'll be honest with you about Strictly. I think we will have to wrap oh, up, unless there you wanted are. to answer the second question. Craig Rebel Hoard is the nicest judge. Um, <laughs> Bruno laughed at me in the middle of one of my dances, really loudly, like really loudly. So I, I, I was in the middle of a rumba, and I was supposed to do this, but if you watch very carefully, I went like this. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Darcy Bustle um, has spent a lot of time doing ballet and very, very, very nice and thrilling. Um, and very, very, she's very nice, very nice. I was hugely starstruck by her, for example. Um, and of course, Len, that was, that was all good. Um, otherwise, that, now, just, I just want to say thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much for and coming. And also, um, lawyers, um, go and get lots of experience. I mean, it's easy for me to say because my um, views are um, all outdated because they're based on the privilege of having no debt. Uh, but please don't undervalue um, the types of experiences that you intuitively might. Pub work, television, running, <laughs> working in retail. It, it, it's impossible to overstate how important those experiences are and how useful they'll be, especially now um, in a market where the value of a degree from here is 
rightly or wrongly, perhaps wrongly, not as potent as it used to be. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.